Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Think Kent Discovers series. Today we'll be screening Autism Reimagined and finding out how a team from the University of Kent have sought to transform working with and understanding autistic children through drama and play. First of all, a big thank you for hanging on in there. We had a few tech gremlins uh, starting off uh, today's event, which we're uh, sorting out at the moment. And I'm really pleased to say that we're joined by some of the stars of the film, and we'll be talking to them a little later on, Professor Nicholas Shaughnessy and Dr. Melissa Trimmingham, who founded and spearheaded the project. Uh, we'll also be joined by Alan Ince, from the, who's a champion of the Imagining Autism Project from the Beacon School. So if you've got any questions for them, uh, as always on these shows, you can send them in via the live chat site Bar on the YouTube page. Uh, they'll be here to answer those and go into a little bit more depth about the film. Uh, so we'll get stuck into those shortly. But first, here is the premiere of Autism Reimagined. <laughs> You know, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to get on my boat, and my boat's called Tangerine, and she's really, really safe. Look, come into the boat. Oh, look at the boat. I will row you. Do you want to sit on one side, Yeah, look. Look, I found a torch. Come into my boat. You can shine the, the torch. A shark. Shark. Harry, look, grab my torch. Harry, get into the boat. Do you want to come into the boat with me? We're nice and soft and comfortable. Oh. Do we start our journey? Okay, and we're going to see all sorts of things. See a shark. Okay, see a shark. Okay, well, as long as he's a long way away, we're okay. Imagining Autism is a creative, play-based practice. Um, it involves working with autistic children in multisensory environments, working with interactive media, it's interest-led, quite important to say that it's mm. interest-led, so we're always following children's cues. It involves improvisation. What we're trying to do is to try and get teachers and parents and so on to start where the child is, to try and put themselves in the child's position. That was a lesson that we had to learn, I think, quite early on, and, and it's vital, I think, to the Imagining Autism ethos, because that child perceives the world very differently to how we perceive it. And also, there are assumptions made about how autistic children experience the world. So if you're following the child's cues, the, the children will have particular sensory interests, um, things that they're drawn to. And that becomes very, very important because autistic children operate in a neurotypical world with neurotypical expectations. And that creates a lot of the challenges that they experience. The aims and objectives were very much framed around the original research questions. If you took key components of drama, imagination, communication, social interaction, in those days the diagnostic criteria for autism were around those three areas. And one thing that is really interesting to know about autism diagnosis is that it's not fixed, it does change, and it has changed very dramatically. Mm. So when autism was first diagnosed, it was actually associated with an excess in imagination. And roll forward, and by the time you get to 2010-11, when our project started, um, it was very much associated with a deficit. And that's certainly the impression that I got as a parent of an autistic child. One of our discoveries, which we're delighted about and have reported on at length, is the fact that actually autistic children have very rich imaginations. The aims and objectives of Imagining Autism have changed mm. um, since the original project. Imagining Autism is more to do with a recognition of the arts, if you like, uh, participatory arts particularly, as, as 
um, a wonderful rich resource, a wonderful rich method um, in education, possibly in health. I'm autistic and I guess my experience of the project, there was several things that were kind of misconceptions. So some people would say that the pod was too overwhelming for autistic kids, that it needed to be low arousal, but actually that's not the case. Autistic people are sensory seeking as well as sensory avoidance. And especially if children are enjoying themselves and they are in control, which is what we allow, they would experience that and love it. Nikki and Melissa it felt my input was really important as an autistic person and to have an autistic person that um, was part of the project to advise them, um, especially on, on things like autistic experience and what was important in relation to autistic culture and making sure that they got the language right. What's the pod? The pod is like a tented structure. And obviously within that space, we put lights and sound. Children would gather outside um, and then you'd obviously they'd meet some of the characters, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. Which would get them used to the idea of going in and the teachers may well have prepared things as well beforehand so they knew what to expect. They would go into the pod and there would be about a 40 minute session. During that time, there would be a, a narrative which the specially trained performers, practitioners had in mind but it was a very flexible narrative. We found that we could translate that into training, uh, yes, for teachers in education settings and um, for parents in community settings. Ultimately, what we do within the pods is it, it's, it's a performance that is, is co-produced with the young people. So we follow their lead and that's really incredibly important. I also support autistic university students and one of them was talking about what it's like for them and they said that they didn't feel like they played as a child. And I was like, well, I think you did play. Um, play can be all sorts of different things. Um, and sensory play, just looking at sand fall through your hands is play. And I think what happens within um, the pods is that we follow the young people's leads and if they want to sit there and pop bubble wrap the whole time, that's okay. If they want to play with the sand and bury the parrot in the sand, that's okay. So that's incredibly important to allow young people to, you know, enjoy the sensory world. And that's a huge part of being autistic, actually, that nobody talks about. We talk about autistic joy and, and that's what you're seeing in the pods a lot of time. It becomes a space where it's somewhere special. So sometimes they're not allowed in their pod if it's in their classroom for a whole week. So it becomes this like mysterious thing and sometimes items appear in it to spark conversations. So by having that there, it became a, a normal lesson suddenly becomes a little bit more exciting, a little bit more engaging. You, you've got them right there. You've got them where you need to teach them. As a teacher, your job is to engage the children in their learning and get them excited about it and learn about the passion because they'll learn much easier and they'll start to develop their own passions. So if you've got that element right there, it becomes a lot easier. And it, it, it's a godsend as a, a, a teacher, really, to have that resource at your fingertips. We've also had situations where the students use puppets and we engage with them with puppets, but even more powerful than that, we've given the puppets to the students and they've um, been able to talk to each other using the puppets. And where, we, if it was just themselves, they'd have social challenges and they'd maybe have a bit of a falling out, they've been able to interact and talk to their, their peers at that level with the puppets as you know, an extension of themselves. It's great to have the full immersive experience in the pod. There's, you get much more focus by having that experience, but there's still a willingness to suspend disbelief mm. through these classroom structures as well. And there's something about time in imagining autism i call it a, a nowhere which is like a now and a here it's about being in the moment being in this this space of uh, presence really and the minute that you're not in the moment the minute that you lose that you've lost the magic you're very very absorbed in that fictional immersive space um, and it's it's the props mm. and the pod that create that my favorite park was a slither
The treasure. You like the treasure. Why did you like the treasure? Was it the, was the teapot inside? The, the teapot was inside. Who, yeah. who, who took lots the teapot? Of gold. And lots of gold? Yeah. Oh, you like a bit of gold, don't you, Benny? Mm. Yeah. But who, stole the, who stole the teapot? Me. No power. Yeah. Was the naughty, red power. The naughty red power? Yeah. <gasps> but did Captain MJ get the teapot back? Yes. Oh, good. Now that we've been able to uh, upskill our teachers around this uh, project, the next stage is to take these uh, basic principles and teach the parents how they can uh, use this at home. And that way, if we've got consistency across the school and we've got it across home, then we've, we, that transition can become a lot easier for our students, which, to be honest, they find really, really difficult. It's given us a chance to, as adults to learn that we need to step back and we need to observe and we need to wait and let children take the lead sometimes. We need to let these children have, they express themselves in very different ways sometimes. We have to learn to pick up on those emotional social cues, their language cues, and actually learn how to explore those and expand them as well. Ultimately, right now, a lot of young people, especially autistic people, neurodivergent people, feel quite un unsafe in schools and um, these pods are quite welcoming, they're a fun experience and it brings the joy back to education and it makes young people feel, feel safer and, and feel that they are enjoying school and I think um, especially for neurodivergent autistic people, um, young people, that's really important to give them a space to kind of play and, and be totally immersed in something and then really enjoy it and by enjoying something a lot of times young people will more likely learn better and feel safer in the school. When I saw that sign outside mm. the classroom that said the Imagining Autism Pod, I just felt this huge sense of achievement. We've, we've done it, it's become permanent, it's alive in a school and it has a life of its own. It is an autistic-led project now, I think that's fair to say. We have had autistic involvement and advocacy at every level of the project. So we've got autistic practitioners, we've got autistic researchers, we've had autistic film artists work with us. It's something that has really moved beyond an academic project about working with, working for and being led by to transform understanding of autism. Yeah, why do you know that, Benny? You're right. Why do you know that? They have it, Autism Reimagined, the premiere of our film. And I'm delighted to say that I'm now joined by Professor Nicholas Shaughnessy, Dr. Melissa Trimmingham, and Alan Ince, all who we saw in the film. Thank you so much for joining everyone. And as I mentioned at the start, uh, do send in any questions if you've got any uh, for our panel to answer. I think let's start at the, at the very beginning. Let's come to you, um, Nicola. Uh, how did Imagining Autism come about in the first place? Well, it actually came about um, because Melissa and I are both parents of autistic children. We just happen, a happy accident, to be uh, lecturers in drama and theatre as well. And we have both discovered um, that there was a relationship between the professional and the personal by using drama methods with our autistic children and um, realising those worked. I was using play, uh, Melissa was using puppetry. Um, so we came together and and decided that we'd got um, quite a lot of strategies that we were using that were in common. Um, we talked to a psychology colleague, um, Dr. Julie Beadle-Brown at the University of Kent, and said, so we've got this um, hunch that if you think about the core elements of drama, um, imagination, communication, social interaction, and you think about the diagnostic criteria for autism and you put them together, um, could they interact productively? And she said, I think you've got a project. And, and an amazing project as well. Um, Dr. Uh, Melissa Trimmingham, let's come to you next. Obviously, as, um, as Nicola pointed out there, a very personal, um, this is very personal to both of you. How did that 
um, what hap what's happening at home inform what you did with the project and and the role that the that, that played in the project? Well, I think there's quite a few elements as, as well as what was happening at home. But I would say that uh, my use of puppetry um, with my son when he was younger, I'm pretty 35 now, so um, he was was much younger um, when we came together, Nick, Nicky and I, into a pilot project um, at St Nicholas School in Canterbury. Um, she was supposed to be um, investigating play and, and I was investigating puppets and I had took a look at what she was doing. It kind of evolved from that. Um, I mean, another thread into it was because I came from a background in professional theatre and I'd done a lot of um, work with special needs children and in immersements uh, with a group called Horse and Bamboo, uh, who in some ways pioneered th this kind of work. Um, and really the, the small, with the puppetry uh, and the Playmobil and so on within the classroom, we then started to build an initial uh, environment, uh, just, just stringing them and making some simple props and it developed from there until eventually we got the money from the um, Arts and Humanities Research Council to do a project, project um, using a, a bespoke pod, which is and um, sorry, Melissa. We keep uh, it's cutting out a little bit, so I'm really sorry to cut you off. But I did want to come to Alan, and obviously we've heard a little bit about how the project started. You're very much that kind of boots on the ground almost um, uh, approach. That you're there, you're in the classrooms um, doing it. Tell us a little bit about when it, you first heard about the pods and the project. Um, what was your kind of initial reaction to that? So the first time I got involved with the project was um, it was uh, one of our ex my ex colleagues who featured in the video actually, uh, Linda Evans, who uh, was liaising with Nikki and Melissa, and they brought the pod into the school um, as a, uh, for a week trial, and um, it was. It was really interesting to see how the children were responding to the pod. So, and for the first time, so some of them wouldn't go in at all. Some of them uh, were straight in, straight away, looking at it, getting involved in it. Um, but that was great because some of the elements could come outside the pod. We know that the, these children find it hard to transition, so it's going to take a while for them to to get used to that and, and we've seen that now that the pod's been in the school um for for a while now that they get used to it and there is part of the furniture of the school and it's all natural for them and transitions a lot easier but that first instance um different children interacted it in different ways and and sometimes it was ways that we've not seen them interact with things before which was absolutely fantastic I understand, um, Nikki, you were back at uh, the Beacon recently, seeing the progress of the pods and actually seeing some of the, uh, the children who are featured in the uh, documentary. Um, tell us a little bit about what that's like to, uh, to see that progress uh, and what that progress has been. Well, it's, it's been extraordinary. Um, it feels, it's, it's a bit like giving birth and then seeing your child grow up um, <laughs> into a, a fully fledged creative adult, it's, it's become really quite autonomous. The teachers and teaching assistants um, at the Beacon School in Walmer um, have become creative practitioners, co-producers um, of, the, of the project. Um, so they are designing their own environments and they have different environments every half term. Um, they've introduced some um, new props um, and new kinds of, the, the, the whole ethos of imagining autism is still there in the sense of following the children's cues, the children come into the environment, they go on um, an imaginary journey um, and they're, they're working together to co-create the narrative through that journey. Um, but they ha they've introduced other little elements. So there's um, a story book outside and they, um, they revisit um, what happened in the story the week before as they sit outside. Melissa and I have been along several times now um, to, to see the work. Um, and it, it, it does really feel as if it has autonomy. The legacy is that it's, it's living um, at the Beacon School and it doesn't really need us anymore for it to thrive.
And I want to talk to you, Melissa, in just a second, a little bit about that, about the progression of the project. But staying with you, Nikki, why do you think it's really connected with children? I know it seems like quite an obvious thing to say that children and play, um, it, it's sort of a second nature, really. Um, but why do you think it's really connected with them? Seeing, you know, when we were filming the documentary, we saw all those children really almost immersing themselves in the environment. Um, and I think that's applicable to um, whether neurodivergent or not, I would, I would say. So one of the key things um, is that it's an intense sensory environment. You heard um, Annette Foster talking about that in the documentary. Um, and at the heart of the whole experience, um, is the the sensory encounter it's a sensory environment and the children explore it um, through sensory means um, and i think one of the reasons that um, it is been so engaging um, for the autistic children is that there is um, an understanding that autistic children prefer low arousal environments because of particular um, hypersensitivities to sensory elements and whilst that is the case, um, those sensory hypersensitivities will be very different for different children. As Annette was saying, um, autistic children are sense-seeking. Um, so we, we also had worked out very early on um, that in order to engage with our children, we needed to follow their cues to learn to play differently um, and to play by different rules actually and so having learned that um there's a, a kind of an, a sense of of joy that suddenly um the the children in the pod realize that they are in control um that they are able to play it is actually it's a very high intensity learning environment and that sometimes comes as a surprise to teachers um who who think that um, the children may be averse to the lights and the sound and that they might be frightened of the puppets. Um, and that's not the case. Um, they always know um, that the, the experience is going to last for a certain amount of time, 45 minutes. They know how they can get out and they can get out and come back in whenever they want to. And it feels like a very safe space as well. So I think that's also important. And I think the fact that they spend so much time in classrooms being taught in ways that might not actually be in tune with their learning differences um, is really the, the key to why the pod um, is, is so attractive for, for this community. And that, that point of autistic joy and hearing all of you talk about it is really something that, um, that stuck with me from the, um, the documentary. Um, Melissa, we're going to come to you next. We've had a question that was sent in um, in advance um, about the nature of the sensory seeking and the sensory avoiding um, that Nikki was just talking about there. Um, with this in mind, other schools or other um, organisations that might want to um, follow suit in, in setting up a pod what would they have to bear in mind in creating that environment for, for autistic children? Right. Well, the first thing I would do is maybe direct the um, Imagining Autism website where there's a huge amount of help there for a kind of do-it-yourself pod, whether it's in the classroom or at home. Um, I think the important thing is that it's a space apart. I mean, the pod itself is quite a, a large structure. Um, just in the classrooms in the beacon, uh, these have been quite simply created with with, with screening off of a um, say a corner of a classroom, and I think once you're aware uh, of the problems of, of things like possible um, noise, lights, um, smell um, that can disturb um, uh, the, the autistic children, you just have to make sure that it's not that you can't have any smell or any noise is giving the children the choice always um, that there's always always some some way of, of modifying um, it, as I said it's following their cues plenty of sensory stimulation but you have to keep the awareness um, that uh, some of it won't be suitable for every child because every autistic child and their sensory profiles will be different but it can be something very simple I mean we've had people set up um, uh, mini 
areas in room, for example, uh, and take a trip to, to, to outer space, maybe with a simple UV light um, and a few um, UV items if you're online to, to get all these things. And on the Imagining Autism website, we've got an awful lot of um, resources there. Um, most useful things to have, suggestions for environments, little mini narratives you, you can do with your own children, either at home or in the classroom. It doesn't have a grand scale. Oh, and also puppetry, very easily accessible, both at home and the school. Um, and, and this becomes an enormously communication medium um, with children and quite humorous sometimes as well, which is really important because autistic children have got a great sense sometimes. and people may not realize puppets tap into that and you were talking about um saying it up in the bedroom as well that's definitely something that um that came across is that it's it's very much based on one's own imagination you can set this up anywhere it's it's almost like that sort of jumpers for goalposts kind of principle with playing football i'd imagine <laughs> yeah. it's tapping into that a bit i would say melissa it is is. I mean, I don't need massively a few sheets, um, the old clothes horse, if people still have those, I don't know. I mean, on the, the website, you'll see us um, building our own environment with a gazebo, um, which we'd set up uh, in, inside. Um, it, it can be a very, very simple structure. Uh, when we first did it, we were kind of stringing a few ropes across the classroom with, um, with, with drapes hanging down. I think it's, it's that just that place apart art is, is portioned. Um, and I, I do know parents that have very successfully done this, this at home. Um, as, and there's a sort of, um, they take you out of space or it might be a trip to the Arctic or the North Pole. Uh, you can do it underwater. Um, some kind of a, a theme, I think, is very huge. Jungle, perhaps. I mean, really, you, as you say, you do have to use your, your own imagination and you can enjoy playing with the child. You have to be really as well not to impose too much upon the child. Um, and often silence actually can be a very useful thing. You don't have to keep jabbering on all the time with a, a verbal commentary. Sometimes they just want to lie and enjoy um, the torches, the UV light, fairy lights. You can, you can do an amazing um, environment just with fairy lights, a few cloths, cushions uh, and a few soft toys. I certainly want to come back to talking about the benefits that this has for children. But Alan, I want to come to you and talk about the benefits as a teacher. How is how is this project and uh, how has it helped you and your colleagues um, in the classroom? So I think it's sometimes you have to give people permission to do things and <laughs> almost and it's that permission to be creative and to think about the imagining autism principles and to be able to adapt them in the way that uh, is going to fit your classroom environment so um, like as Nikki and uh, Melissa have, have said you know they've put it in a corner of their classroom or they've done like a just a little bit of uh, even smaller than just a corner, shall we say? Um, or we've like at Walmart, we've got the whole pod, so we've got a different range of different uh, spaces to use. But it's um, it's allowed teachers to look at their themes or topics and say, right, how can we use uh, Imagine Autism to be a vehicle to help this topic? Um, and just by it being visually, has really helped uh, children with their language. Um, so if they've gone in. Um, one of the, the testimonies I've heard is that they were doing about, it was a dragon's lair um, in their pod in their classroom and they only went there once a week. And when they came out, the they were doing a, an English piece of um, work and uh, the child wrote, the dragon's eyes were evil. Now, none of these words have been put to her at all. It was all from her imagination in the pod, but we would not have got that le level of communication um, from that child, especially within uh, literature uh, content. And uh, that was absolutely fantastic to get that level of language out of her. Well, there's always the saying has gone traditionally, like all work, no play and all that stuff. But this really seems that it intersects the work and the play as a teacher in order to enhance what you're uh, what you're trying to get across to sh uh, students. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, if we can be as creative as possible for teachers, we're going to get their imagination. Um, we're going to get their interest. You know, you can tailor it to children for their own personal interest. If they're interested in trains, then we could always create a pod that is a railway station, for example, and do, um, you know, like maths within that lesson or but through the imagining autism um, principles, you know, what do you want to measure of the train? How do you want to measure that? How, you know, how long do we have to wait for the train to come to the station? All those sort of skills that they would need um, out in the world, shall we say, through their life skills, they're learning, but just in a slightly different way. Um, and imagining autism allows us to do that. Well, we've heard from some of your uh, colleagues at the Beacon, uh, a couple of TAs there who've told us about the uh, about the project and uh, some of the many things that you've spoken about there, Alan. So we're going to come back to all of you in a sec, but just for a few moments, let's hear from uh, from Stacey and Rachel. It gives them a safe space to explore fears and, and things that they're anxious about, um, you know, things like when they're anxious about weather and things like that. And as you saw today in, in, in the demonstration that you know, you, you have a storm, but it doesn't have to be a bad thing. So it's, it's a safe space to be able to confront things like that, and which obviously will set them up in and all I, aspects of their life. Yeah, and also they go home and talk about their time in the IA pod, and, and they do. The parents have asked before what it's about and things, and they go home and talk about it, and they can speak about the things they've done at the school and the different the room they've been in and the different experiences they've, they've had in there. Something that's really struck me um, working on the uh, documentary and looking at the project is there's been a lot of, I'd say, myth busting around autism that's, that's involved. Um, Nikki, I want to come to you for that. Have you found that, you know, we heard about the sensory seeking as well as sensory avoiding. Have you found the project has been able to bring to light uh, the, the true authentic autistic experience for children and young people um, to, to a more mainstream audience? Yeah, I'm a bit hesitant about saying that there's there is a true authentic autistic experience, um, but uh, it's certainly done a lot of myth busting and it's challenged a lot of stereotypes. Um, and a lot of those stereotypes are generated through the media, um, through the way in which um, autism has been represented or misrepresented, um, and and also. As I, I say in the documentary, um, changing understanding of the diagnostic criteria. So we now, for example, recognize that um, autistic um, experience is something that we see in girls and women, as well as boys and men. Um, and the biggest thing for us um, is the fact that there is this it's called originally it's called imagining autism and when we got follow-on funding the project was called autism reimagined and we put imagination center stage um and that is because the project works through imaginative and play-based methods but one of our biggest discoveries in the project um was the rich imagination um that autistic children have um, and which has um, not been recognised. Um, so that's that's uh, you know a big area of development, and that goes sort of hand in hand with everything that has been said about creativity and play and the importance of that in the curriculum. Um, sadly, um, in the UK, creativity has been progressively designed out of the, curriculum, and I think that's detrimental to all um, young people, particularly autistic young people. Um, and so it's it's absolutely fantastic and incredible to see the ways in which the creative curriculum is thriving in a school like Beacon, um, a school that shows incredible um, imagination um, in the way that they respond to their learners. And, and it's also important to say that a lot of the work that's being done is being done um, with very, very few funds um, and in the teacher's own time as well. They're so invested with the work um, that they're, they're doing it themselves in their own time after school and um, preparing the pod. Um, so that's also testament, I think, to, to how valuable they, they feel the approach is. Um, Melissa, I imagine challenging the stereotypes has been, um, has been helped by involving autistic children and autistic adults in all stages of the project? 
Well, it certainly has because um, I look back, I mean, we were so even away uh, back in 2010 and 2011. And I think that Nikki and I um, have come on an enormous uh, and starting to work alongside uh, autistic practitioners in particular, um, help us to understand what had been going on really in the pod. I mean, we were surprised by the wonderful um, imaginative involvement of the children um, early on, uh, especially nonverbal children, uh, or children who, for example, we had one child who um, seemed to communicate through a camera. I mean, he would snatch um, the camera off uh, whoever was filming the environment and wipe it clean if we weren't careful. And he was obviously fascinated by a cameras gave him a and then suddenly his creativity took off with him photographing um the the environments and so on so so this creativity was fascinating and gradually um as we started to connect with the autistic community i think that the project itself um changed i mean obviously the research project a stopped in 2014 then we got follow-on funding um and by that time um we were really beginning beginning to move on understandings um, uh, about um, these children and how they communicated um, with the world. Um, I think that's, that's, does that answer your, your question um, at all, Cameron? Absolutely. And I think it was really telling about how the, the project has progressed. Um, when we heard at the end of the documentary there that there's autistic filmmakers involved, there's um, there's different areas of the creative sector that have got involved. And I think that's really shown, um, you know, imagination is limitless and, and that's a really key thing to get across. But what I would like to delve into a little bit with Alan on that sort of note is, yes, imagination is limitless. There's so many ways to tackle, um, tackle the curriculum using uh, play-based methods like, um, like we saw with the pods. What are the challenges, though, of, of putting that into practice? We heard uh, Nikki there talking about um, arts uh, being really, really um, stamped down in curriculums and the challenges that that's faced. Obviously, funding in the creative sector is a key one. As a teacher and doing it in practice, what have been the challenges that, that you've seen and, and think need to be addressed going forward? Well, you know, budget's always a problem, isn't it? Uh, within schools, we can read that in the uh, in the news, um, you know, uh, fairly regularly. But it's, I think, we're a solution focused school. So wherever there's a challenge, wherever we need to step up, we will have to, we will find the method. And we've had really um, a great response from the the community. We had someone run from our Beacon Warmer site to our Beacon Folkestone site and he raised over a thousand pounds for us which has helped to pay for materials for art supplies for uh, some lights to go into Warmer some sound equipment to go into there as well to really try to create as, as much of an immersive experience um, because as you said the imagination is limitless and that is up to the us as creative practitioners to to look at as well and um it's it so you know you can spend as much or as little money as you like but it it is you've always got to focus on the end goal and it's making that immersive a, a, as you can um you know very lucky to have staff that will give up their time because they believe in the project uh, like nikki mentioned and will come in during the holidays and change it uh, change the environments around and one of the issues with that uh, about the environment of one of the challenges is that um, we've tried to tie it into the curriculum as possible but when you've got lots of different year groups using the big pod in the room it's quite difficult to make sure that one environment fits it all so if someone's doing underwater you can't then have um, a mountainous range in the arctic can you so you've got to try and make it adaptable and to be as uh, broad as it can be so sometimes there's a beach but there's also a forest on the beach or something like that or you know and I know last year they they stuck with a theme and then they just kept it evolving as it went through the year so they didn't have to spend too much time going over the different environments so they started off with Mr McGregor's garden 
and then by uh, by by Christmas it was then a winter wonderland. So they added some snow round in the garden, and then by January it was then um, dinosaurs were introduced into a Jurassic world. So you can see how it had a common theme all the way through. But they're using really inventive, creative ways to keep down um, the amount of time that they spend on it and um, the amount of money that we'd need to then put in to change the pod uh, drastically, shall we say. Do you feel your colleagues and yourself, Alan, your understanding of autism has changed because of the pods? Uh, I think these children challenge our perception of autism every day, if I say so, um, because they're also individual um, and their autism is part of them and it can be very individual to them it can you know um traits or the way they act may be similar but they're individuals at the end of the day so it it by going into a different environment like a creative environment you're learning more about that individual child you're learning about what creativity they have what imagination they want to drive forward how how they want to express themselves in a creative um artistic way and that's quite exciting so i think it is uh, really important for people like uh nikki and melissa who uh, maybe look at it from a broad range and are able to use those techniques and and help us to understand that in a more detailed but as for an individual basis it's been wonderful to see that and see the individual child and the individuality of it, Melissa, that must be as a creative, that must be real, um, what, what, how do I put it? That must be really exciting to, because you're almost improvising each session. You'll have that kind of template, I'd imagine, but it's the improvising, it's the making it bespoke to each child, and that just really must get the creative juices flowing. Oh, it. It's wonderful. I mean, we, we all love it. I mean, we have a loose, if you're doing a proper pod session and, oh gosh, if you've got a, a company of three or four, well, um, you would, would have a loose, you know, to your environment, uh, something like, um, I mean, I'll take outer space because that's the thing that, that, that most that we did. Um, and you really, um, you've got a loose narrative and you know, there's certain points, something's going to happen. Like there might be a, a rock star on the moon or something will happen um uh but you can work around that and you're very much working as a team in this almost like this energy you know with, within the um the pod that you're working off each other you're working with the materials you're working with, with the children um and it is so rewarding you could you want to one with a child for example with a puppet and you can really just get stuck into that and you know that the other members of the team will be working with the other children so it's a very flexible um, environment and obviously, yes, very creatively exciting and stimulating. I mean, right from the very beginning, um, we're offering um, training sessions. We called it Training the Trainers um, within the University of Kent. We had a lot of uh, students um, train in these methods they're out there um, doing well we know they're out there sort of working um, away often as artists or in, in schools um, and very much it was we also started offering those sessions out to artistic practitioners and so on and then they came to, to work with us on, on projects um, so yes I mean I think uh, it, it very much appeals to, to, to artists to come and work you know that sort of border between drama and, and the visual arts i mean i like making and i love puppeteering uh, and i find it immensely satisfying to to use a puppet for example with a child i mean this report um, alan was giving of, of verbal progress you know progress in language we've had that over and over again you know reports of children um suddening up either at home or at school um and and using language that they've never um never used before communicating um autistic children are communicating all the time actually but we don't always pick up on it um so yeah there's very much a learning process going on i think for for um artists and teachers working um with with autistic children using these methods i certainly a huge amount and go on learning all the time you mentioned training a few moments ago i, I i'm fascinated by this because that sort of that looseness, that improvisory nature that you spoke of using puppetry, all of these different 
um, you know, all of these different styles and, and methods. Um, that's surely quite, that can be challenging to sometimes teach to, um, to teachers or parents who that's not what they've been trained to do. They're not <laughs> trained dramatists, yeah. you know, in a way. And, you know, you hear people that spend careers trying to learn how to improvise or how to do puppetry and that it's a real art. How can you translate that and, and teach that? Well, um, well, for a start, anyone who's been trained as a, an actor or a, an actress might find it harder to do the methods. So we, we also with blank uh, slate, uh, the training that we, we do, we did it at the Beacon um, in about uh, 2018, 19, thanks to um, th This is, I will do a puppetry session. You don't have to be a, a virtuoso performer to play with a puppet. I mean, we're talking here about about um, playing really um, and anyone who's um, spoken a soft toy to, to their child would be perfectly capable of translating that into a glove puppet and the session that um, I do with the teachers for example is and parents is simply getting them to do a couple of simple like focusing the eyes which makes the puppet much more alive um, the whole time and to keep it moving and not do it suddenly sort of flops and they're just simple tricks like that um, really um, make make the puppet much more um, effective um, and other uh, sessions that we really get for example teachers and parents and carers to go out and observe um, we send them out on a sensory trip trip to pick up um, stones and leaves and so on and really get them not just to, to look but to see which is tr trying to get them to show the joy that you can have um, in that sensory world. Um, uh, I mean, I, Nikki, one of Nikki's um, great, great um, she does in one of the training sessions um, is to get um, the group to choose something that's a little bit shiny, like, for example, your glasses, and just to look at these glasses for a very long time. Um, and it's amazing at the end that people are absolutely fascinated by the kind of uh, the light shining on them, the shapes, just uh, extraordinary, almost transformations of ordinary things. One thing that Nikki might do in the training, for example, is um, is interrupt somebody doing that, which is basically what we call stimming, which is a fascination where you know they close on something, and people get very annoyed. You know, so I was enjoying that. You know, how could you, how could you interrupt me? We say, well, in matter of fact, ch children who st him interrupted like that and and perhaps perhaps feel quite similar um to that so the training that we uh, we do we're not trying to turn people who um actors and actresses we, we're training them to just to play with children using these these simple methods they may not even realize it's drama actually a lot of them are like drama games and so on but um they're really not intimidating i think i'm, I'm right in saying that having seen all the really positive reports from from training sessions that we've done and about reports and feedback nikki i want to come to you here is it, have there been occasions you can give some, uh, and some examples from where where that feedback and those responses to the activity um where that has informed how the project is carried out um i can give lots of examples of um of feedback i think the um yeah that we were working um at a, a school in kent called the helen allison school um that was sort of back in in 2011. um by the time we got to that school it was the third term of, of working together and so we I, I think we all agreed that each term was it, we got better we got we got better as a, as a team um and we were working within um, a set of constraints that had been imposed quite rightly by the psychology team, um, which were because we were being evaluated um, for scientific efficacy. Um, and, and so there were certain things that we had to adhere to. And one of the things was that um, the, our methods were were blind. The psychologists evaluating the project, most of them were blind to the actual methods, but the parents also were not supposed to know what we were doing. Um, they were supposed to, uh, they knew that, that they'd consented for the children to be involved in some kind of drama project, 
Um, I think most of them knew that we weren't putting on plays. Um, but other than that, um, they were not supposed to know the methods. Anyway, we, we rocked up one day and there was um, a mum <laughs> there who had asked to meet us. Um, having uh, realised that something was happening on Tuesday evenings with her son. Um, and we later saw that the letters that she'd written to the school, but it was incredible how what had been happening during the day was being generalised and talked about at home um, in, in the language that her son was using. And we even had um, anecdotes about children trying to um, use cookers as stoves to light fires after a, a pretend campfire had been had lit in the session. Um, in fact, one parent had to call the fire brigade, which was um, a little unfortunate uh, as an example of generalisation. Yeah, a bit, a bit too method acting. Although, you know, it, not acting is, is the principle of um, imagining autism. But um, she, she turned up and she said, I want to know what you're doing because I want to be able to do it at home, you know, and, and I, I want to talk to you and I want to know what you're doing. And we weren't supposed to tell her. Um, <laughs> we're, the, basically, it was almost like, you know, the kind of the project had been blown to some extent by the fact that we'd even started to have that conversation. Um, uh, but ultimately, um, we did have the conversation and we, we then had lots of conversations about the difficulties of the project design and, and the problems of blinding. Um, because actually, when the one of the psychologists involved in the project said, I actually need to unblind myself and come in and see what you're doing, and then saw what we were doing, um, he said, OK, if we'd have known what your method was, we might have approached the evaluation very differently. Um, we might have had more cameras around. We could have actually coded um, interaction and engagement um, so that they would have been much more involved with the process. And the kinds of data that were collected would then have been very different. And we do now, so when we, we were looking for follow-on funding, although follow-on funding isn't based on research, the whole point of follow-on funding is that you are rolling the methods out, disseminating something that has been deemed to be successful. We, we still were able to build in um, some elements of trying to discover ways of doing data differently. Um, and, and that all came from, from the experience of the, the, the surprises that we had within the pod in the way that the children engaged with us, but the fact that it didn't end there, those stories, those narratives um, continued into the home environment. Um, and even if the fire brigade did have to be called, it, they, they were fine about that. Well, I'm glad there was a happy end to that, uh, that, that <laughs> tale. Um, is it, do you find it's important, um, Nikki, to show that this project can be applied outside of the young neuro community as well, that it can be applied um, in other settings, in other schools, um, children of other backgrounds, maybe facing other um, challenges. Do you think it's important to get that across? Totally. And I think there's um, much more understanding now um, due to the um, great work of the neurodiversity movement, that there's much more understanding of neurodivergence and neurodivergences more broadly. Um, so autism comes into that, as does ADHD and, and a whole range of other differences. Um, and, uh, and some of that will impact on how a young person communicates, um, you may see examples of stressful behaviour, uh, often things that are referred to as um, problematic behaviour is actually induced by being, uh, being stressed and being in an environment that feels unsafe. Um, and that will impact on, on learning um, and on, on every aspect really of, of being in the world or being in the learning world. Um, so if you are in a safe environment, one that feels uh, that it's in tune with your interests, your differences, your learning preferences, um, then your whole experience in education is going to be different. Um, and, and that doesn't just apply to um, neurodivergent children, it applies to um, every young person. 
um, that that need to be in touch um, with with their interests. Now we. I've uh, got a few moments left uh, of this event. It's been great to really um, take a deep dive into, into the project. Um, so I'm going to go around the group just uh, for final thoughts. Alan, I want to come to you first. Um, advice to other teachers and parents um, that will be wanting to, will be looking at this and be wanting to set up their own pods and doing their own activities. Yeah, so choose a space that you want to do it in how you want to do it make sure that the the pod is it has some some form of entrance basically so there's a, a transition into the pod so it's a, a definite separate space so then go into and then got that element of it it really is up to your own imagination to come up with different elements to ensure that um, it's um, as immersive as, as possible so uh, whether you use something like bubble wrap or whether you uh, buy something that looks like a waterfall or something like that however you want to do it I've seen some absolutely fantastic creations uh, I think you saw in the uh, the video like the jellyfish made out of the the, the umbrella which was uh, was amazing um, you can always go on the website uh, that um, Melissa mentioned, um, which is great to get a few more interests, but I think just go and have a go and see what happens. Um, they can always get in contact with us if they need any further support. Um, we're open to help. And I'm sure as the community grows, there'll be lots of ideas that, that we can sort of spread around really. And Melissa, what's been the most rewarding aspect of the, the project and all the work that's been done? Oh, the most, well, I'd say it's the richest and most interesting and creative part of um, my much um, life uh, as an academic, and it's just been hugely rich. Now, um, I'm actually um, a visiting member of this at the moment because I, I'm actually officially re uh, retired, but Imagining Autism is carrying on in my life. Um, we've just started up the IC, a community interest company called Panda Arts, which is participatory arts uh, of neurodiverse audiences, artists. and that is because um, I want to carry on um, this work. Nikki wants to, um, so does a colleague of ours called Helen Taylor, as part of the training at the Beacon um, uh, in 1918, sorry, 1918, 2018, and um, this this will carry it's just a very rich and important part um, of my life and obviously it is connected as we said at the beginning with my own personal life um, having an autistic son uh, who still likes his puppets actually and so do I he lets me indulge <laughs> with, with, with the puppets when I see him oh that's amazing um, it's not something you ever lose I'd imagine no it really isn't <laughs> I have such fun with them and so does he <laughs> That's so good. And uh, Nikki, Melissa saying there that the project will be continuing. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about the, the plans going forward, what you're hoping to see in the next stages? Just give us a, a little bit of a flavour about what's to come. OK, so um, we're forming um, a spin out company, um, as Melissa mentioned. And the idea is that the, the kind of work that we did at Beacon, um, where we, you saw how the teachers and the teachers, some of those teachers actually took the work into other schools because we trained a range of special needs teachers. So we would like to see that model um, reproduced um, in other, other schools in other areas. So um, we're probably going to be starting in Brighton um, because that's where, where Helena is based. Um, and we have interest from quite a few schools in Brighton. Um, but there, we also have connections with schools in London and the Midlands. Um, so the idea is that the, the project will, will just do a sort of snowball effect. Um, we will go in, do the training, um, set up, um, not just imagining, it, it, in fact, it's, it's very much um, grown out of imagining autism and evolved into something um, a little bit different. Um, so basically it's using creative practices in the curriculum um, with neurodivergent young people. That's that's sort of where the starting point is. 
But we'll be keeping our eyes peeled on that. It all sounds really, really exciting. Nikki, Melissa, Alan, thank you so much for uh, joining in and answering those questions. And a big thanks to you at home for watching. Uh, before we go, we're obviously going to, uh, anyone who joined in a little bit later, we're going to play the film uh, again one more time. Um, you can find out more about uh, all the amazing University of Kent research projects that are going on by going to www.kent.ac.uk forward slash research to find out more. And as we mentioned uh, in the uh, in our chat, you can obviously find out more about the Imagining Autism project uh, by going to that website. In case you missed it, like I said, here is Ima uh, Autism Reimagined. But from all of us here, thank you very much for watching and goodbye. You know, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to get on my boat. And my boat's called Tangerine, and she's really, really safe. Look, come into the boat. Oh, look at the boat. I will row you. Do you want to sit on one side, Yeah, look. Look, I found a torch. Come into my boat. You can shine the, the torch. A shark. shark. Hurry, look, grab my torch. Do you want to come into the boat with me? Nice and soft and comfortable. Until we start our journey. Okay, and we're going to see all sorts of things. We can see a shark. Okay, well, as long as he's a long way away, we're okay. Imagining Autism is a creative, play based practice. Um, it involves working with autistic children in multi sensory environments, working with interactive media. It's interest-led, quite important to say that it's mm. interest-led, so we're always following children's cues. It involves improvisation. What we're trying to do is to try and get teachers and parents and so on to start where the child is, to try and put themselves in the child's position. That was a lesson that we had to learn, I think, quite early on, and, and it's vital, I think, to the Imagining Autism ethos, because that child perceives the world very differently to how we perceive it. And also, there are assumptions made about how autistic children experience the world. So if you're following the child's cues, the, the children will have particular sensory interests, um, things that they're drawn to. And that becomes very, very important because autistic children operate in a neurotypical world with neurotypical expectations. And that creates a lot of the challenges that they experience. The aims and objectives were very much framed around the original research questions. If you took key components of drama, imagination, communication, social interaction, in those days the diagnostic criteria for autism were around those three areas. And one thing that is really interesting to know about autism diagnosis is that it's not fixed, it does change, and it has changed very dramatically. Mm. So when autism was first diagnosed, it was actually associated with an excess in imagination. And roll forward, and by the time you get to 2010-11, when our project started, um, it was very much associated with a deficit. And that's certainly the impression that I got as a parent of an autistic child. One of our discoveries, which we're delighted about and have reported on at length, is the fact that actually autistic children have very rich imaginations. The aims and objectives of Imagining Autism have changed mm. um, since the original project. Imagining Autism is more to do with a recognition of the arts, if you like, uh, at participatory arts particularly, as, as um, a wonderful rich resource, a wonderful rich method um, in education, possibly in health. I'm autistic and I guess my experience of the project, there was several things that were kind of misconceptions. So some people 
would say that the pod was too overwhelming for autistic kids, that it needed to be low arousal, but actually that's not the case. Autistic people are sensory seeking as well as sensory avoidance. And especially if children are enjoying themselves and they are in control, which is what we allow, they would experience that and love it. Nikki and Melissa felt my input was really important as an autistic person and to have an autistic person that um, was part of the project to advise them, um, especially on, on things like autistic experience and what was important in relation to autistic culture and making sure that they got the language right. What's the pod? The pod is like a tented structure. And obviously within that space, we put lights and sound. Children would gather outside um, and then you'd obviously they'd meet some of the characters, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. Which would get them used to the idea of going in and the teachers may well have prepared things as well beforehand so they knew what to expect. They would go into the pod and there would be about a 40 minute session. During that time, there would be a, a narrative which the specially trained performers, practitioners had in mind, but it was a very flexible narrative. We found that we could translate that into training, uh, yes, for teachers in education settings and um, for parents in community settings. Ultimately, what we do within the pods is it, it's, it's a performance that is, is co-produced with the young people. So we follow their lead and that's really incredibly important. I also support autistic university students and one of them was talking about what it's like for them and they said that they didn't feel like they played as a child. And I was like, well, I think you did play. Um, play can be all sorts of different things. Um, and sensory play, just looking at sand fall through your hands is play. And I think what happens within um, the pods is that we follow the young people's leads and if they want to sit there and pop bubble wrap the whole time, that's okay. If they want to play with the sand and bury the parrot in the sand, that's okay. So that's incredibly important to allow young people to, you know, enjoy the sensory world. And that's a huge part of being autistic, actually, that nobody talks about. We talk about autistic joy and, and that's what you're seeing in the pods a lot of time. It becomes a space where it's somewhere special. So sometimes they're not allowed in their pod if it's in their classroom for a whole week. So it becomes this like mysterious thing and sometimes items appear in it to spark conversations. So by having that there, it became a, a normal lesson suddenly becomes a little bit more exciting, a little bit more engaging. You, you've got them right there. You've got them where you need to teach them. As a teacher, your job is to engage the children in their learning and get them excited about it and learn about the passion because they'll learn much easier and they'll start to develop their own passions. So if you've got that element right there, it becomes a lot easier. And it, it, it's a godsend as a, a, a teacher, really, to have that resource at your fingertips. We've also had situations where the students use puppets and we engage with them with puppets, but even more powerful than that, we've given the puppets to the students and they've um, been able to talk to each other using the puppets. And where, where, if it was just themselves, they'd have social challenges and they'd maybe have a bit of a falling out, they've been able to interact and talk to their, their peers at that level with the puppets as you know an extension of themselves. It's great to have the full immersive experience in the pod. There's, you get much more focus by having that experience, but there's still a willingness to suspend disbelief mm. through these classroom structures as well. And there's something about time in imagining autism i call it a, a nowhere which is like a now and a here it's about being in the moment being in this this space of uh, presence really and the minute that you're not in the moment the minute that you lose that you've lost the magic you're very very absorbed in that fictional immersive space um, and it's it's the props mm. and the pod that create that my favorite park was a slither the treasure, you like the treasure. Why did you like the treasure? Was it the, was the teapot inside? The, the teapot was inside. Well, who yeah. took, who took the teapot? Gold. And lots of gold? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you like a bit of gold, don't you, Benny? Mm. Yes. Yeah. But who stole, like the, who stole the teapot? Me. The power. Was he a the naughty? red power. The naughty red power? Yes. Yeah. <gasps> but did Captain MJ get the teapot back? Yes. Oh, good. 
now that we've been able to uh, upskill our teachers around this uh, project, the next stage is to take these uh, basic principles and teach the parents how they can uh, use this at home. And that way, if we've got consistency across the school and we've got it across home, then we've we, that transition can become a lot easier for our students, which, to be honest, they find really, really difficult. It's given us a chance to, as adults to learn that we need to step back and we need to observe and we need to wait and let children take the lead sometimes. We need to let these children have, they express themselves in very different ways sometimes. We have to learn to pick up on those emotional social cues, their language cues, and actually learn how to explore those and expand them as well. Ultimately, right now, a lot of young people, especially autistic people, neurodivergent people, feel quite un unsafe in schools. And um, these pods are quite welcoming, they're a fun experience, and it brings the joy back to education, and it makes young people feel, feel safer and, and feel that they are enjoying school. And I think, um, especially for neurodivergent autistic people, um, young people, that's really important to give them a space to kind of play and, and be totally immersed in something and then really enjoy it. And by enjoying something, a lot of times young people will more likely learn better and feel safer in the school. When I saw that sign outside mm. the classroom that said the Imagining Autism Pod, I just felt this huge sense of achievement, we've, we've done it, it's become permanent, it's alive in a school and it has a life of its own. It is an autistic-led project now, I think that's fair to say. We have had autistic involvement and advocacy at every level of the project. So we've got autistic practitioners, we've got autistic researchers, we've had autistic film artists work with us. It's something that has really moved beyond an academic project it's about working with, working for and being led by to transform understanding of autism. Yeah, why do you know that, Benny? You're right. Why do you know that?